Good evening, and welcome to the Heavens Declare. This is our 12th month of this whole session, the Gospel in the Stars, the Heavens Declare. Well, what a great star constellation to end on. When we speak of Pisces, that's my birthday, and sure, a number of you. The two fish. I like the thought that it's double, double of everything, double good, double blessing, double portion. But tonight's theme is the gospel of beauty. I think of the scripture, he will beautify the meek with salvation. What is it that God is glorifying, beautifying? When I think of grace, I think of beauty. I think of glory, favor, radiance, charm. All the things that are track. I think the gospel of grace, in contrast to the Mosaic law, is the idea that you have shifted from the law of requirement with penalty to the attraction of grace. In other words, the gospel of grace is such a beautiful gift. How could anyone refuse it? It doesn't come under penalty of hellfire and damnation. <laughs> It's the attraction of the Father's love to restore all humanity in the Son, bringing many sons back to glory. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this wonderful time that we come together to share this moment. May the Holy Spirit inspire our hearts, our understanding, bringing forth wisdom and beauty into our lives that we may see through the eyes of Christ, the true beauty as heaven extends into earth through us. Transform it through our own recognition of grace, mercy, compassion, forgiveness, that you make all things new even in us and through us, reconciling all things through us to yourself, that the world begins to reflect what you created not what we've remade of it. And in such an hour as this, we really need to see the beauty of grace upon a world that's in such need of grace. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you so much for joining us tonight for the Heavens Declare a Gospel of Beauty. Yes, I believe that the Spirit truly afresh wants to shed forth his love by the power of the Holy Spirit, especially right now. We just invite the Holy Spirit. We thank the Holy Spirit for his presence, for his quickening to all of us, even now. You know, the word says the word is forever settled in heaven. And the word also says, let the word of Christ dwell richly in you. And the word is dwelling richly. And tonight, the word will increase within us richly because God richly lavishes his love upon us. And we are a blessed people. The heavens do declare, and we are a heavenly people. We are seated in Christ in heavenly places. And I just pray truly that our ears would be open to heaven. Our heart would be open and receptive to heaven like never before. And we truly understand on a higher dimension that truly God desires to beautify his people. That includes you and I. God, he enjoys his faithful lovers. He adorns the humble with his beauty and he loves to give them victory. Anybody need a victory tonight? I believe that as we get beautified in the presence of the Lord, 
It's his pleasure to beautify his people. That is good news for all of us. I love getting beauty treatments. I want to be more and more beautiful with the presence of the Lord, with the glory of the Lord, which truly is our shield. The glory of the Lord is in um, a motion, a forward motion in our lives, because the word says the earth shall be filled with the knowledge of the glory of God as the waters cover the seas. That is saturation of grace and of truth. And the glory of the Lord is rising even now by faith up on us. Amen. Amen. Amen means so be it. Yes. Well, I've just so enjoyed understanding a little bit more of the revelation that God gave to David. And David was a man after God's own heart. And David studied the stars, the heavens, and he was united powerfully with the word. His prayers, his songs are truly divine. Well, in Psalms 19, where we've taken this series from, verses 1 through 6 show the beauty of the heavens. And we're going to look in just a minute in verses 7 through 11, which shows the beauty of the word. So let's start in Psalms chapter 19. It says the works, and that's what we're going to look at, verse 1 through 6, and the word of God to the chief musician, which is the Lord Jesus Christ, a psalm of David. The heavens are telling of the glory of God, and the expanse of heaven is declaring the work of his hands. Are you hearing what heavens are? are declaring. Verse 2, day after day pours forth speech and night after night reveals knowledge. Truly, God is wanting us to get a revelation. Verse 3, there is no speech nor are there spoken words from the stars. Their voice is not heard yet. Verse 4, yet their voice has gone out throughout all the earth, their words to the end of the world. In them and in the heavens, he has made a tent or a tabernacle for the sun. Verse 5, which is as a bridegroom coming out of his chamber, it rejoices as a strong man to run his course or to run his race. And we all have a race to win. It's a race of life. It's a race of victory. Verse six, the sun's rising is from one end of the heavens and it's circuit to the other. And there is nothing that is hidden from his heat. We see right here, God's plan is seen in the stars in the study of biblical astronomy, which is called a tabernacle, a house for the sun. Hallelujah. So we see a picture and I'm going to show you or we're just going to read and may it really get in our spirits. Verse seven, about the word of the Lord. This is the second section section of this psalm. Verse 7, the law of the Lord is perfect or flawless, converting or restoring and refreshing the soul. Good news. The Lord is our shepherd. We shall not want. He leads us to bring restoration to our souls. Thy statutes or testimony or witness of the Lord are reliable and trustworthy, making wise the simple. The precepts, verse 8, of the Lord are right, 
bringing joy to the heart or rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. May we really lock into that because I believe tonight God wants to enlighten our eyes so we have a fresh vision, a fresh understanding of the divine purposes of God, of how we fit in this, and that truly he washes us tonight in the water of the word, yes, to purify and make holy his beautiful bride. Verse 9, the fear of the Lord or the worshiping of the Lord is clean, enduring forever, and the judgments of the Lord are true. They are righteous altogether. Verse 10, they are more desirable than gold. Yes, than much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and the dripping of the honey comb. Verse 11, moreover, by or in dwelling in the word as the sun is in the heavens, by them your servant is warned or reminded or illuminated or instructed. This is what the word does. And in keeping them, there is great reward. And how true this is. So we see right here in verses uh, 7 through 11, four things that the word will do as we receive it. And as we allow it to operate in our lives, it will convert or restore or refresh our soul, our mind, will, and emotion. Glory. I pray right now we truly sense, experience the divine refreshing of the word. It makes wise the simple, truly today like never before. Body of Christ, we need the wisdom from above. The third thing the word does is it rejoices the heart. Anybody need a rejoicing of a heart? Yes, God wants to truly turn any morning to dancing, that our heart is rejoyed. Re meaning again, brought back to better than before. That's the kingdom is the joy of the Lord and the joy is in you. We just need to connect with truly what is within. And the fourth thing the word does is it enlightens the eyes. And I know that the spirit of God truly wants to enlighten our way. So that is what the word is and does. It's a lamp to our feet. So it points us in the right direction. Hallelujah. And that direction, I believe, is truly upward. See, the pure in heart, they see God. They see love. And what we see, we be. And God is wanting us to be better than we've ever been. Yes, it's a season that we get beautified in the presence of the Lord. Truly, the gospel is a gospel of glorious beauty. I love it. Well, the signs in the zodiac are called houses of the sun because it's what he lives and moves and dwells in. And the story of the zodiac is one of our divine journey. It's declaring what the spiritual pattern is in our own lives and in Jesus, the pattern son. The zodiac is the earliest revelation to mankind from creator God. So it must be significant. It must be so important. And as we get a revelation of what is in the heavens, yes, heaven, the word says, is coming to earth. He is gathering all things in heaven and earth into one. That's why we are to be heavenly minded. Well, Job chapter 38, 32, can you bring forth Maseroth in his season? 
Maseroth marks the path of the sun and is the 12 signs of the zodiac or the constellation. You see on the right of the screen, the zodiac is a circle and it means a circle. And what we are going to be looking at tonight is Pisces and truly each sign signals a dimension of a spiritual reality that is to be drawn out from within us. Yes, there is a time and a season for every purpose under heaven. Just like God asked Job, can you bring forth Maseroth or the constellation in his season? No, but God does. And God makes all things beautiful in its time and in its season for its specific purpose. That's a word for somebody. God makes all things beautiful in his time, in his season. And as we see beauty, beauty is going to arise and come upon the scene. God wants his beauty to truly be pleasing because it's his pleasure to give us the kingdom. Righteousness, right alignment, peace, hallelujah, and joy. You can't be beautiful and be sad. God is wanting to rejoy us. Amen. That means do it again and again and again. Paul says rejoice in the Lord always. Oh, and again, I say rejoice. God's word is powerful. Truly, it is a gospel, and the gospel means good news. And I pray we have our ears attuned to the voice of faith, the voice of heaven. We are, we become what we look at, and we create out of our mouth our destiny. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Song of Solomon said, death and life are in the power of the tongue. So you have, yes, a miracle in your mouth as we align with heaven, as we declare righteous judgment (laughs) upon ourselves. God is working out all things for my good. As we decree and declare his favor, his glory is rising. That is what we will see. You with me? Well, the heavens, the constellation houses the sun. And what is so significant is that this is... The Hebrew year 5782. 82, 80 is a number. It's pay, P E Y, for mouth, speech, sound. That's why it's so important in this decade of pay what we speak. And you see, the two is meaning, and you see the screen right there is bet. And it's the second Hebrew letter. Bet means house. The word picture for the letter bet is house. Why is this so important? Well, two house. What is God wanting to build? Unless the Lord builds the house, everything else is in vain. Wisdom is building the house. God is building within his people a house who house the presence of God, the joy of the Lord, the light of the Lord. That's why this is so significant at this season that we really get on the page with the purposes of heaven and what heaven is declaring. So we see bet is the second letter of the Hebrew alphabet. Interesting, bet, another word for bet is son. Another word is daughter for bet. And you've heard of Bethel, bet L, house of God. Yes, God is wanting to glorify, beautify his house 
whose house we are. And as we come into alignment and agreement with him, we're going to agree with his purposes. And you know what? <laughs> we'll be a much more joyful and um, light person. <laughs> yes? Yeah, we can be intense with the fire of God, but we can be trusting. We can relax and know that we can trust in the Lord with all our heart, not leaning on our own understanding in all our ways, acknowledging him. And what does he do? He lights our path. God's got a direction for us to go. Yes, that direction is upward or inward. It's ascending the hill of the Lord. Oh, and it's a hill full of glory, a hill full of beauty. Uh, uh, it's Zion is the hill. But we're a city set on a hill. And Father is wanting his city, his house, holy holy, whole, complete in Christ. Hallelujah. Well, in Pisces, the fishes, the two fishes are a representation of the church, the called out, the people of God. And it's just interesting about the fishes. Christ speaks of the members of his body as born of the water. Hallelujah. And the early Christians, the sign was the ichthus, a fish. And truly, God wants us to not be fishes out of water, <laughs> but to be fishes in the water. Where is our natural habitation? Yes, the water of the word is where we live and move and have our being. I do love swimming in the water because it, it relates me to the refreshing and I feel like I can just swim and jump. I do backflips because I'm so full of joy in the water. And the kingdom of heaven also was said, it's like the kingdom of heaven is like a net that was cast into the sea. Interesting, isn't it? That truly... It was a, the heaven is like a net. So the dimension of the realm of the heaven is like a net cast into the sea. And it brought all of that was full to shore. This has a message. Truly heaven, come your kingdom be done your will on earth as it is in heaven. Ho, oh, you talk about a divine network. The operation of the kingdom of God, the net has been thrown out and God has a purpose and truly it's to draw all men to him, to love. Hallelujah. I love the kingdom of God. It's in us. It's righteousness. It's peace and it's joy and it's in the Holy Spirit. Well, the next screen you see is Pisces, the band. The first decan or minor constellation in the house of Pisces is the band. And you see this band, it binds the two fishes together. And there's two fish. One fish is northward, meaning it's going into a higher dimension. It's ascending. It's swimming in an upward progression. Yes, to the center where the king, the throne is. It's perpendicular. So it's speaking of triumph. Hallelujah. I love this perpendicular ascending northward, northbound fish that is in a higher dimension. But notice the band. So there's a horizontal also that is connected. We see here a picture of Christ who was on earth, who lived in the heavens, who was bringing the kingdom on earth. He went around doing good, healing all who were oppressed. 
he had a mission and he walked out that mission doing father's will. He came in the volume of the book. It was written of him to do the will of the father, the pattern son. He walked in an open heaven. So here we just see these two fishes that Upward fish moving upward, yes, to the North Pole, to the uh, polar north, just like where Zion is, the sides of the north, the city of the great king. Hallelujah. There's so much here, but there's a divine connection. That was put there by God and it's in the heavens. And truly the two, the upward and the horizontal, they are connected. They are tied together. One cannot go without the other. We are all divinely connected by the love of God. And God has got a purpose for this band. And when I was getting a picture of this, what came to me was this next screen. Oh, I pray this ministers to you. I drew them. This is Hosea chapter 11, verse four. I drew them with gentle cords, with bands of love. What is this band in Pisces? It's the band of love. Jeremiah had this understanding the Lord appeared to us in the past saying, I have loved you with an everlasting love. Therefore, I have drawn you with loving devotion. Do you know what? <laughs> God has a hook in your mouth of love. And just like the Shulamite said, draw me and I will run after you. Aren't you more willing to run after the Lord? You know, this cord of love just lets us know now that nothing can separate us from the love of God. Truly, Jesus Christ is the greatest fisherman with the most marvelous net. And he is gathering and drawing all things unto Christ. You know, Paul in Romans chapter 8 said, I am persuaded. May tonight we be persuaded that nothing can separate us from the love of God that's in Christ Jesus. So I started with the prayer that the Holy Spirit would shed abroad in our hearts or awaken us to the reality of the love of God. Truly, God is love. And the more we encounter and experience his love, Hallelujah. We're going to get on his page and we're going to be beautified and glorious. Hallelujah. More and more and more. Well, what is just beyond the two fishes with the band, you see that there in the middle, is Andromeda. Andromeda means a man ruler. Her name in Greek, Andromeda, means man ruler. And it's interesting. We'll see this a little bit more. She is bound and seems helpless, but she is to be a ruler. Hallelujah. Well, in the beginning, in Genesis, Man in the beginning was created male and female. That was the image of God, Genesis 1, 26 through 28. And God said, let us make man in our image and in our likeness. And God blessed them and said unto them, and it's the same thing he's saying to us, be fruitful. Love is a fruit. <laughs> Be fruitful, multiply, replenish the earth with my glory, subdue it, and have dominion. We need to really get a revelation of our destiny in Christ. It is to rule and to reign. Hallelujah. The image of God. We're created in the image of God is the emanation of his nature. 
Hallelujah. What's his nature? His nature is love. Hallelujah. God has such an awesome plan. And as we really are aware and live out from our union with Christ, we will live in a higher dimension, truly of peace, of love, and of joy, of power. Yes, of power, love, and a sound mind. As we really know, I mean knowing within our heart, Christ in us is the hope of glory. As we nurture the nature of Christ, you talk about joy unspeakable and full of glory. God wants to take us higher than we've ever been by his love. Hallelujah. Well, you see another picture here of Andromeda. And Andromeda is a line of bright stars in the house of Pisces. It's with a woman and her arms and, our, and her feet are in chains. Wow. Well, who is this woman? This woman is the bride of Christ, the bride, which is the city of God, and she is chained. Oh, help us, Holy Spirit. She's in bondage, just like many in the body of Christ are in chains, whether it be of Babylonian captivity, but the arms or the service or the feet, the walk has been hindered or haltered. My question is what has hindered, chained, or obstructed the flow of God in our lives? What shackles does even tonight God want to reveal so we can heal and get rid of? Yes? God wants to get rid of the shackles of low level living or low vibration or negativity, or some of us need to get rid of fear. And how does that happen? The love of God casts out fear as we focus on his love. What about resentment? That's a chain that binds or unforgiveness, even not forgiving yourself. God wants us free and liberated by love. And a chain is condemnation. See, it says there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Oh, what's another chain? Guilt, shame, blame. As we get wrapped, as we allow the presence of God to love us to life, he wants us to awake, Isaiah 52, 1 and 2, awake, awake, stop being in slumber and sleep, put on your strength, oh Zion, this is Isaiah 52, 1 and 2, you are Zion, know your identity as light, put on your beautiful garments, hallelujah, oh Jerusalem, oh captive daughter, you loose yourself, Arise and sit down. Truly, we need to awake, awake, to arise and sit down, seated in Christ in heavenly places. I hope you're hearing the voice of the Spirit. He's wanting us to, in reality, experience Christ, who is our life, because when Christ who is our life, appears, we appear with him in glory. You talk about power. Oh, God wants to free us from self-interest, from substitutes, from not holding the head Christ Jesus. God is wanting an anointed company to come forth in power and victory and glory. That is why he died to bring us into truly resurrection, life and power. He is jealous over us. 
He has espoused us to one husband, Christ. We are the city of God. And you know what? Glorious things have been spoken of thee, O city of God. Wow. When we connect with what has been spoken, what is true of us, we will arise and shine and radiate the glory of God. Good news? Oh, well, beyond Andromeda is the final constellation in the house of Pisces. And what you see there is you see Cephas, the crowned king. Oh, there's so much here. This is the gospel in the stars. And I immediately went to Psalms 2, 6. Psalms, yes, David wrote the Psalms, most of them. And, you know, when Jesus was talking on the road to Emmaus, he said, um, you know what? These are the words written of me in the Psalms. So David surely had such a union with the Spirit of God. In Psalms 2, 6, Yet have I set my king upon my holy hill of Zion. We see here in, in Cephas, we have a picture of a bearded man. He's wearing a crown, a royal robe. He's seated on the throne and he holds a scepter. And of course, we know this is King Jesus enthroned in the highest heavens, the North Star, the central point, hallelujah, where he is calling us to awake and arise to. Yes, heaven is his throne. The earth is his footstool. Do you see the beauty in the gospel in the stars? Hallelujah. He's wanting us to partake of his life, his light on his holy hill. Yes, that's where we have been called. Hallelujah. Zion, meaning a high elevated place of light, illumination, understanding. That's why we pray that the eyes of our heart would be enlightened. Glory. Well, more about Cephas, the crowned king. The Greek name comes from a Hebrew word meaning branch or royal branch. Yes, he's the vine. We are the branches. And in Isaiah 4, 2, it says, and the branch of the Lord will be beautiful and glorious in that day. I pray you're getting that wave of glory treatment. Truly. Well, looking at this sign, we see him with many crowns. And this is kind of right out of Revelation 19. We see him with a scepter. And it, you see the scripture verse right there. Psalms 45, verse 6. This whole Psalm 45 is a song of love. <laughs> David said, my heart is overwhelmed with good. It's a song of love. And I pray our hearts become overflowing with the theme of the heavens. Thy throne, O God, Psalms 45, 8 is forever and ever the scepter of your kingdom. What you rule with is a right scepter. Truly, God makes all things right, or God makes all things new. Hallelujah. That includes us, a new mind, a new heart. God is wanting us to get on his program. And we see here, he's got a royal robe. Well, I believe coming from uh, Revelation 19, it's the vesture dipped in blood with the name written, the word of God, meaning he is in innocence. He's full of life. That's his royal robe. Hallelujah. You see this awesome, and we see him with a beard. 
Beard speaks of, yes, a maturity, but we also see in Psalms 133, behold how good and pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. It's like anointing that ran down upon the beard. Do you see the beard? Even Aaron's beard. Aaron, his name means light, that went down to the skirts as the dew of Hermon, as a dew that descended upon Mount Zion. Dew is speaking of the anointing of the Holy Spirit. And it's there that the Lord commands blessing even life forevermore. Yeah, you talk about an elevated high life. That is what God's gospel of beauty in the stars is declaring. I pray that we truly receive and allow him to unveil in our hearts what he is saying, what his voice is communicating to us. Oh, he's, he's, going to have his way, which is one new creation, man, till we all come to the unity of the faith, to the knowledge of the Son of God, unto a perfect man, unto the stature of fullness in Christ. God wants us to believe, to have faith of what his word is decreeing and declaring. Well, Just a a little bit more about Cephas, the king. It says in Isaiah 28, verse 5, we know he has a crown on his head. Oh, I love this scripture. In that day shall the Lord of hosts be for a crown of glory and for a diadem of beauty unto his people. What is this saying? The crown of glory, the diadem of beauty is the indwelling spirit of the Lord. God himself, love himself, love, light, fire, glory is to be our crown. Oh, royal mindset, holy mindset. He is becoming our all in all. And see, a king has a queen. Oh, and it's in Psalms 49, verse 9, that psalm of love, Psalms 49, I'm sorry, Psalms 45, verse 9. King's daughters were among thy honorable women. Listen to this. Upon thy right hand, did stand the queen in gold of Ophir, meaning the queen stood beside him, not below him, but with him, reigning in honor. She was a queen in gold. Gold speaks of glory, the divine nature, and Ophir was a place of wealth and of the finest gold. Oh, God wants a people that are truly beautified. And the meek are the ones who are beautified. And meek people agree with God. I want to agree with what God is saying over his people. He, the king, Cephas, is truly Lord of all. And she, the queen, rules with the king. What a beautiful picture of a rightly related relationship. Oh, beautiful, beautiful. The gospel is truly a gospel of beauty, of grace, of glory, of dignity. And this Cephas the brightest star in his right shoulder, and you see it there on the screen, is Alduramin, and it means quickly returning. Yes, Lord comes quickly. And the star at the belt, you see, is Alpharic, and it means the Redeemer. And yes, he is our Goel, our Redeemer. He is desiring that we experience a full redemption. And then 
we see the star on the left knee. What a picture. It's the star Al Ray, and it means the shepherd. What a picture. What a glorious picture. Truly, the Lord, the Lord is our shepherd. We shall not want. He makes us to lay down in green, full of life pastures. He restores our soul. Anybody need divine restoration? It's the word of the Lord that brings it. Hallelujah. The Lord is my shepherd. And in Revelation 7, 17, the, for the lamb, we know the lamb is the light at the center of the throne will be their shepherd. He will lead them to springs of living water and God, love, light will wipe away every tear oh, from their eyes. We have a lover of our soul who is loving us to life he is enlightening us so that we see the glorious reality of the heavens that we are to be unified with. Amen. And the last screen, Psalms 50 verse 2, out of Zion. Zion is a mountain of life. It's a sunny, unobstructed place. Uh, no chains. Out of Zion, the perfection of beauty. God shines. Hallelujah. His radiance, his perfect beauty shines. And you know what this means? Is that God has shown a glorious crown out of Zion. You talk about dignity. You talk about beautiful and elevation. The joy of the whole earth is Mount Zion, the city of the north, the city of the great king. See, the joy of the Lord is in you. It is in you. And as we allow the word to rejoice our hearts, we're going to see what even John saw in the book of Revelation, he was transported. He saw the beautiful bride coming down adorned for her husband. Hallelujah. And she, the bride, had the glory of the Lord. Her glory was his light. They became one. Glory. Having the glory of God and her light was like a stone most precious, a living stone, a lively stone. Truly, the heavens are declaring a gospel of beauty. And you know what's very interesting is Pisces is also related to the feet, which gives direction. Christ washed the disciples' feet. And you know, in Isaiah 57, it says... <laughs> What a beautiful sight to behold, the precious feet of a messenger over the mountains announcing good news. He comes to refresh us with a wonderful news, announcing in Zion, thy God reigns. It is the gospel of peace. It's the gospel that is beautiful feet announcing good things to come. That is what is glorious, and this is what God is bringing about, a company of messengers with the gospel of peace, announcing good. See, God works all things for good. God is good. Goodness, surely goodness and mercy follows us all the days of our lives. Goodness is glory. God is wanting us to connect with the realm of the kingdom of God, of the increase of his government and peace. There is no end. And the anointing that went from the head of Aaron to the feet is that same anointing that is upon us. God wants us to know now 
a fresh anointing because it's the anointing of Christ that breaks every yoke. God wants his people free. Why? Creation is groaning for a manifestation of the sons of God who walk in their high places, who walk in glorious liberty because they're one with the liberator, with the deliverer, with the glory of God that he has given so that we be one. Amen. I pray this series has truly been a blessing to you. I pray it has drawn you closer to the lover of your soul. I pray that it has salted your taste bus so that you taste and see how good God is because God loves you. He's got a glorious plan, a glorious purpose for you for your life now. Praise him with me. Praise him. Praise his holy, holy, holy name. Oh, you are so good. So loving. We just thank you. In Jesus name. Oh, hallelujah. Breathe him in. Breathe in that light and that love. Amen. Here's Ken. Thank you, sweetheart. As she was bringing forth the word tonight, there was one specific word I was hearing in my spirit. She spoke of the gospel of beauty. And I was hearing the word contrast, as if to say the gospel of contrast. And it brought to mind a familiar passage of scripture in Ecclesiastes, the writer of the preacher or the wise man, Solomon. And I just printed off these verses, and I just want to review some thoughts here before we close out tonight. And the writer Solomon is expressing himself in verse one. He says, there is an appointed time for everything, and there is a time for every event under heaven. Time is what governs our experience in this world. It is a world of contrast. Good and evil is a contrast. And in the idea of contrast, we have a sense of duality a world that is always changing. And that means just like the rising and falling of the waves of the sea, giving birth to, dying to, everything in a state of contrast is a state of opposites. And he goes on in that passage to speak of a time to give birth, a time to die, and so forth. And he gives all these various contrasts. And it's interesting because one of the latter ones that he relates to is something that you and I are subtly facing the realization of right now. There's a time for war and a time for peace. And he's not saying in one sense, one is good and one is evil. It's just simply contrast. Contrast means we live in a changing world. Nothing stays the same in this world. That's the world we live in. That's the backdrop of the world we live in. If you follow the news media, for example, we're always looking to see the contrast. What's the latest news, the latest development? What's the latest contrast or conflict? What has so radically and suddenly changed that just simply jars our senses from our comfort zone? Oftentimes, we like things to stay the way they are. We don't want things to change. We don't want to be disruptive. We want to follow our routine. But you know, we don't really have a choice in that matter because we are not alone. We live in a world that is people populated by every descriptive humanity, nations, tribes, tongues, all in a state of 
constant change, contrast and conflict. But then he comes down to a verse 11. He has made everything appropriate or beautiful in its time. He has also set eternity in their heart, yet so that man will not find out the work which God has done from the beginning even to the end. Interesting, isn't it? He has set eternity or immortality in the heart. The heart is the seat of desire. What it seems to indicate, even though there are many different concepts, translations, thoughts on this passage, the idea is that there is within our heart the desire to live eternally, to pursue eternity or immortality, or a sense of curiosity or fascination. Do we have an endless future? Or does life just suddenly end and that's it? He set eternity in our hearts as though something to pursue and to seek after, yet in a world of time or contrast. For eternity is not evident in our world. And yet so that man will not find out the work which God has done from beginning even to the end. In other words, we cannot discover the full breadth, height, length, width of creation in this world. Our minds cannot fathom that. We don't have the time to discover that. We don't have the resources, and we're not by ourselves. Our world is affected by change. It is affected by contrast, conflict, relationships, war, and peace as well. So what is eternity to us? It's not just endless existence in time. It's something that God has set there that we seek and pursue after that which cannot be found in a world of contrast. The contrast simply reminds us everything here changes. We change. We get older. We may have moments of pleasure, moments of pain, moments of health, moments of affliction. We're always in a state of contrast. And it does also say, but there is nothing better for them than to rejoice and to do good in one's lifetime. We know we're taught to praise God, to be thankful, to be glad, because we can't control situations around us in the world. The thing we can govern is our response, our attitude, and our sense of appreciation, and that we recognize while we presently may not experience eternity as part of our conscious existence, we know our Father, our Creator, is not only eternal, He has set within our soul eternity. And He has desired that we, through a world of contrast, pursue after that which does not contrast or conflict or is divided or dualistic. It's in the vertical relationship, not the horizontal. And the vertical is that we continue to arise and ascend together as one in Christ, letting go of our separate identities, our conflicts, our contrasts, finding the commonality of Christ within our being. And then I want to also refer to a portion of Scripture in Mark chapter 10. You remember the story of the rich young ruler that came to Jesus and said, Good master, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And I have a feeling that the answer that Jesus first gave him is exactly what he wanted to hear. And he said, Well, you know, keep the commandments. Do this, do that, and the other. And he could quickly respond, I've done that. Like, hey, I've scored. But then Jesus goes deeper. He doesn't go to the surface of his religious upbringing and execution of commands. He goes to the deepest motive of his heart. What is the treasure of your heart? What is it you're really seeking after? What was he seeking after? He wanted the best of both worlds. 
I want it good here. I want it good there. That's, to me, eternal life, at least in his thinking. So Jesus throws out this to him. And what does he say to him? One thing, only one thing. Wow, that shouldn't be hard. One thing you lack. Go sell everything you possess. And not only that, give it to the poor. He probably didn't have much appreciation for the poor. The thought of being poor by selling everything was like an abomination to him. And he says, if you do that, you'll have treasure in heaven, which you can't see here. Then come follow me. But at these words, he was saddened. Why? He had no intention of doing that. He thought he's going to get off the hook like we often do. I'll hear the words I want to hear. My life is okay, just like it is. I'll get into heaven. I'll get into God's heaven because everything is just the way I want it to be. He went away grieving, sad, because he owned much property. He worked, maybe inherited. It doesn't matter. But in a world of contrast, he is among the minorities, among the elite, just as in our world today. He's among the few who seem to have it all. And so he looked around to his disciples who had watched and heard that whole scenario. And he said to his disciples, how hard it will be for those who are wealthy to enter the kingdom of God. The disciples were amazed at his words. But he answered again and said, children. This time, not just the wealthy, how hard it is to enter the kingdom of God. Remember what I believe the apostles said, or perhaps it was also Jesus who said through many tribulations, I know it was actually Paul, we enter the kingdom of God. Through many conflicts, trials, and contrasts, we enter the kingdom of God. Why? Because the kingdom of God is nothing like the world out here. It's nothing like our life here on earth. It has nothing to do with our separate existence. It has to do with our joint participation in Christ as one son and one body, which is not visible here. It is in radical contrast to our separate personal life here. And yet Jesus said to seek it and to pursue it. It's within you. It's not out here. Pursue it. And so when he made the statement, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. Now, I know there's a lot of interpretations about that, but but the meaning is the same. It is impossible or actually easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. He didn't say it's impossible. It's just easier. Why? Because, for example, whether you're putting a a, a large thread through a needle or, as some believe, a camel being shoved through the needle gate, if that be the case, it means there's a stripping that is necessary to be able to pass through that narrow gate. You are stripped of everything you hold to out here. Is that taking a vow of poverty? No, it means we understand we have but one value that we carry with us from this world, and it's what we brought with us from heaven. That's our soul. Nothing we add to here, nothing we contribute, accomplish, gain, or acquire, or give up has anything to do with the redemption of our soul. In fact, one verse in the scripture in the Old Testament said, the the redemption of man's soul is costly, that he should cease trying forever. The redemption of our soul comes through a work of grace and a work of faith and a work of letting go, laying down our soul life in this world, even for others, to find our soul has meaning only, you might say, in the bank of Christ, not the bank of the world. The question says, well, then who can be saved? And he said, with people, with man, it's impossible, but not with God. But with God, all things are possible. Then the disciples or Peter begin to say, but Lord, we've given up everything. We've already done that. We've laid down everything to follow you. Where do we stand? 
And he said, there's no one who has left house, brothers, sisters, mother, father, children, or farms for my sake or for the gospel's sake, but he will receive a hundred times or a hundredfold as much in this life as in the present age. But he will also receive a hundred times as much now in the, excuse me, let me read it back again. There is no one who has left all of this for my sake and the gospel's sake, but he will receive a hundredfold as much now in this present age of these very things. You can receive the abundance of the things that you have let go even in this life, but you will not possess eternal life until you come to the next stage. That's when the manifestation of eternal life. So you see, we are going through a stripping or a letting go of the ephemeral, the temporal, the illusory, the things that appear in the world that are not real. We are deceived in believing they are. All we can carry is the position, the relationship of the word of God in our hearts. He has set eternity in our heart. In this world, we can't discover all that God has done. But we can come to know his love for us through our love one for another, through our love for the word of God and for the appreciation of the grace of God. But he also said, you'll receive a hundred times as much in this life. Brothers, sisters, mothers, children, farm, everything you've given up, along with persecutions. Oh boy, there it is again. But in the age to come, eternal life. The gospel of beauty is the gospel of contrast. Only God can beautify, and that's his glory. You see, it was from glory that we fell and became fragmented and separated. And you see, the gospel is the gospel of reunif reunification, the gospel of reconciliation, where we are brought back together in one body, one living presence, who is Christ. And in Christ, we ascend together as one back to the Father, back home. And you see, we bring nothing with us that we acquired here. Just like he said to Martha, in contrast to Mary in her home, when Martha was upset, she was doing so much to prepare a wonderful meal for Jesus, and her sister could care less. She would rather sit and listen to Jesus, as if that wasn't as important. But Jesus said, she's chosen the better part, and that will not be taken. Why? When we listen to the word of God, when we come into relationship in Christ and one with another and get still and know, we gain access through understanding, through wisdom. And you see, I want to commend Sally for all the work she has applied in the presentation of these teachings the gospel in the stars. And you see what it says? God has set so many signs and wonders, not just in this world, but throughout the heavens. He has set eternity before us to help us to understand you can't fathom it, you can't search it out, you can't discover it. There's not a book written that you can find it, but you'll find it through your heart when you surrender everything else. Even Solomon came to a place to say, all is vanity. He had the resources of the elite, of the total wealthy person that could touch, taste, handle, pursue, have an appetite for anything he wanted, from one end to the extreme. And he came to realize it's all vanity. Better is the person who has little but he lives and enjoys his family, his work. He appreciates the simple things of life. And I just say this in closing. We want to keep a proper focus. We want to keep a proper understanding that eternity is not here. And nothing out here is going to contribute to it. It is set in our heart to seek because that's where the kingdom of God is. And the kingdom of God is found by the releasing of all other things that give a particular personal value to us in contrast to everybody else. It's what makes me different, better than, or whatever, different than anyone else. That's not the gospel. The gospel is the commonality that we have in Christ for which the law helped us to die 
to our selfishness, our self-image, our self-centeredness, and realize the futility, not one has achieved that place of glory other than Christ Jesus. Because he didn't try to keep the law of Moses. He just did what the Father showed him. He walked in the Spirit and fulfilled the instruction and direction of the Spirit to bring you and I together to the cross, to put an end to our past, to give us a new beginning as a new creation. These are the things that are important. These are the contrast. And that contrast finally comes a realization, as Paul says in his own eulogy, so to speak, or his own recognition, the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought a good fight. I finished my course. I've kept the faith. Hence, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord will award to me and to all who have loved his appearing. That's what we're after, precious, the gospel of beauty, the appearing of the Christ. May God's grace be with each one of you and with our precious brothers and sisters in the nation of Ukraine that are suffering so tremendously. There's still a time for peace. This too will have its end. Putin will have his end. He will find his limit, and I'll be sharing more on that in the next newsletter coming out. But just remember, our end was found in our beginning, and it's complete when we return to our beginning, and time is no more, and all things have been restored. That's the path of righteousness by which we dwell in the house of the Lord forever. God's grace be with you and bless you and keep you. And don't forget Sunday night, we'll look to see you again. Bless you in Jesus' name and be a blessing one to another. We appreciate you so much being part of this series. Have a great night.